Okay, good, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased today to welcome our guest, uh, Ian Bremner, from uh, the president and founder of uh, Eurasia Group. Um, Ian um, is founded the group uh, back in 1998, apparently with just $25,000, and now has um, experts, experts and resources in 90 countries. Um, he's written nine books, um, often looking at the intersection between politics and markets. Um, as you can see now, in the world today, we have um, a number of um, huge global issues um, at the moment. We have the Russian um, moves into Ukraine. We have the, the shifts in the Middle East with the Islamic State now getting close to the Turkish border. Um, of course, also we have the Ebola situation in West Africa and the fears um, and concerns about that spreading to the rest of the world. So Ian's here today to discuss why all these uh, things are happening right now, these um, shifts in the Middle East and uh, in Russia, and its impact in the markets around the world. Why we're not seeing this, uh, you know, these political, geopolitical changes being reflected in markets yet. So before I talk too much, I'll just give the floor to Ian. And if you could just uh, speak to the crowd, please. Yeah. Yeah. So Ian will probably talk for 15, 20 minutes and then take your questions. Oh. Okay, I'm standing. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andy, and I'm delighted to be back here. I think I've, I've uh, spoken with this group, and I recognize a lot of faces in the audience, actually, uh, more than a few times at this point. I uh, just got back uh, to Tokyo last night. I have a few pretty intense uh, days of work and uh, delighted that the weather ended up being not uh, soaking wet as I got here. Uh, this is an interesting environment uh, to be talking about what I do, uh, the geopolitics. 2014 has been a fantastically busy year. Uh, for geopolitics. Uh, we, all, all of the issues that you just raised, Andy, uh, Iran, uh, negotiations and tensions, the war in Gaza uh, and Israel, uh, South and East China Sea, Hong Kong tensions, we can go on and on. Uh, I think before I get into any of them, it's worth talking about why they're connected, because they are. Uh, there are, Obama gave a speech uh, two weeks ago uh, at, in New York for the United Nations uh, General Assembly session, and he said that uh, President Putin and his militarism needed to be stopped uh, strongly uh, because it was, it threatened uh, to rent the international, the fabric of the international order. I, I certainly agree that Putin's a bad guy. Um, but I, I, I guess I would say that there are three things out there that are much more important in terms of threatening the international order than Mr. Putin, and, and that he, he's really uh, much less a cause uh, than, than he is uh, an, an, a, a necessary conclusion of those, of those three. The, the first uh, is that the United States really has much less interest in providing global leadership, right? Um, and you can blame Obama a bit uh, as a president that doesn't have either the experience or inclination to really do big think foreign policy and lots of commitments around it. You can certainly blame the second term team in the U.S. a bit for not being as cohesive or uh, as strong uh, as the first term team was. But you'd, you'd have to go much broader than that. Uh, you'd certainly want to talk about the overhang and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, expensive, costly in human lives, very unpopular. You'd have to talk about the energy revolution in the U.S. and the feeling that this stuff just makes the Middle East in particular and other parts of the world a little bit less important for the Americans to engage in as policemen. You'd want to talk about the the gap uh, between rich and poor in the United States and the fact that for well over 50% of Americans whose real incomes have been effectively flat for several decades, that they don't believe that they benefit from US-led globalization. You'd want to talk about Congress and the fact that uh, 
the incredible polarization of Congress has meant that the willingness to support policies that could benefit America's power projection in the world, whether it be TPP and trade or whether it be immigration, is incredibly low. So there are just lots of things going on. It's overdetermined, as we like to say, uh, in terms of why the U.S. is playing less of that role than it had historically. A second set of reasons um, is that America's allies are much more diffuse, much more divergent, uh, and, and therefore uh, have a harder time supporting U.S. policy than they otherwise might. Again, lots of reasons for that. Uh, look at Europe, uh, and a Germany-led Europe is simply much harder for the Americans to coordinate with. They're less oriented towards U.S. policy geopolitically. That's true on China. It's true certainly on the NSA and Snowden. It's, term on, it's true on U.S. unilateral sanctions on European banks, a host of other issues. It's, it's, it's true in um, the response on things like ISIS. Um, the Brits are much more aligned with the United States, uh, but they've been incredibly focused on, over the past months, on the concern of whether the, U the U.K. is going to stay the U.K., um, now there's the question uh, ongoing of uh, whether or not they're going to remain in the EU. Uh, France has been perhaps even more aligned uh, with U.S. geopolitics uh, in the past couple of years, but it's also governed by the least popular and probably weakest uh, French president since World War II um, and, uh, and facing massive internal governance um, issues. So, you know, the fact is that you can say the U.S. is leading from behind, but it's really hard to lead from behind when your allies are even further behind. Um, and then the third set of issues is that uh, the countries that are not America's allies, the emerging markets, the BRICS, most importantly China, are, are stronger. They have a larger footprint but they're absolutely not interested um, in, in playing the kind of role to help a reluctant United States find some form of leadership. Uh, look at the reactions to U.S. sanctions policy on Russia. Obama claims that the international community supports the Ukrainian people. Well, I've got to tell you, the international community has a very strange way of showing that. Um, you know, the fact is that none of the BRICs are supporting U.S. policy on Russia. Uh, that most of them are actively profiting from it, uh, certainly China, which is the winner uh, in the, in the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Um, when the United States asked China uh, to provide support in fighting Iraq, uh, ISIS in Iraq, and, and of course China has vastly more economically at stake, commercially at stake in Iraq than any other uh, major economy in the world, uh, the Chinese response wasn't even crickets, because crickets make noise. Uh, it was it was nothing. Um, so I think you put these three things together, it's fairly obvious that geopolitical conflicts as they emerge are likely to get larger. You're not going to respond to them very effectively. But here's the fourth point, and this links with the name of the presentation that, that, uh, that you, you've asked me to give today, which is the impact on the markets. Fact is, there's not much impact on the markets, right? Um, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. We're not on the precipice of World War III. We are facing increasingly large numbers of geopolitical brush fires. And when one gets really big, then a bunch of countries that are relevant will get together and they'll try to stamp on it a bit, and then it'll smolder, and then we'll go back to doing nothing, and then we'll find another one, right? But that's precisely because there's not viewed to be um, a lot uh, of risk to the global economy from these crises, whether it's Ebola in some of the poorest, least developed countries in the world, or whether it's Ukraine, which is kind of a failed economy, but was before this all started, um, you know, whether it's the Middle East, which is, you know, blowing up, but look at where oil prices are today. And, and of course, the fact that the markets aren't paying much attention, and the fact, most critically, that the United States was considered the cleanest dirty shirt after the financial crisis, but really the U.S. is the cleanest, geo, uh, cleanest dirty shirt geopolitically, right? Uh, in an environment where geopolitical volatility is growing, so the U.S. is so buffered from so much of it compared to other countries in the world, especially Europe. You look at the geopolitics out there right now and so much of it affects Europe so much more 
Look at Russia. It's the Europeans. Look at ISIS. Where are they going to go if they're leaving the Middle East? It's Europe. Look at the Iran deal. What happens there when it falls apart, as it probably will? Who's the higher energy price is going to affect more? It's the Europeans. Look even at Ebola and what's the likely outcome if, you know, you see suddenly cases emerge outside. Well, first of all, most of those flights are going to go through Europe, but also um, the immigrant populations much less integrated the potential for political backlash in a country like France, which can't afford it, much greater concern. And so, and the Europeans, of course, are very, they're barely, barely recovering. The Italians have already slipped back into recession. I worry much more about that. Is more money going to come to the U.S. given greater levels of geopolitical volatility? Yes. Is that going to lead the United States to want to do more to respond to these geopolitical conflicts? I don't see it. So, that, I mean, that's, that's where we are. And I, I'm, I'm happy to talk in detail around a bunch of these things. Maybe I'll take a few minutes just talking in detail about some of them. Uh, start with Russia. Um, it's been a failed policy by the United States. That's pretty obvious. Well, the thing that I find most unfortunate about uh, where we are with, with Russia um, is, is that the United States and allies somehow allowed Ukrainian President Poroshenko to believe that he might be allowed to defeat the Russians in southeast Ukraine, or that if he, if he failed, that he was going to get support from NATO. They, they invited him to attend the NATO summit. They, they didn't give him anything. Um, they weren't inviting him to join. They weren't going to give him military arms, or they weren't going to send anyone on the ground, but they invited him. And they sent all these leaders through. I, I saw in the New York Times an op-ed from a, a well-known Chinese dissident last week that said that it was America's fault for not providing support for the demonstrators in the Occupy Hong Kong movement, and that this was going to make them fail. I so disagree with that. The worst thing the U.S. could have done, God forbid, was tell the demonstrators on the ground in Hong Kong that we supported them, allow them to get wiped out, and then do nothing. That would have been a true disservice, because that's precisely what the U.S. and the Europeans, many Europeans, have done with Ukraine. And now you've got 3,500 Ukrainians dead senselessly as a consequence of that, when they were never going to get that level of support from the U.S. and Europe. I'm not saying this because I'm happy about it. I'm not happy that you're not providing, that you don't have the leadership. I'm saying that the least you can do is do the analysis right. Um, and, uh, and, and not, I mean, it's like when you apologize to somebody and, and you're doing it for yourself as opposed to for them, but you're going to keep acting the way you've kept acting. It's like, you know, if, you, if you're going to talk to the leaders in the Maldives, don't apologize for climate change. Tell them you're not going to do anything. Give them water wings. Help them, help them buy land so they can move someplace when their country doesn't exist anymore. That would be the appropriate thing to do, right? Um, and that's not what the U.S. has done on Ukraine. Um, I think that the Russian policy on Ukraine is to drive a wedge between the Europeans and the Americans. I think they're being somewhat effective in doing that. They'll be more effective over time. You see that absolutely in the responses today, these days, from Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary, Finland, even France. Um, I, I, I actually believe there's, there's a conventional wisdom out there that says that, that the, 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 the the security challenges from Russia and from ISIS are making NATO grow stronger. I disagree. I believe that they are exposing rifts within NATO. Um, we see that uh, in the rifts between the United States and many Europeans on Russia. We see it in the rifts between the U.S. and Turkey, the U.S. and Germany, Britain and Germany, Britain and Turkey on, on ISIS. I think those rifts will grow. So if anything, it's making NATO weaker. Um, that's, that's a little on Russia. Uh, again, we can do more questions later. I, do some questions later. Uh, ISIS, uh, for as negative as I've just been on U.S. policy on Russia, I'm actually quite comparatively positive on U.S. policy on ISIS. I don't want to say just positive, because uh, what's happening in ISIS, uh, with ISIS on the ground clearly is, is, is not a happy situation. But if the purpose of U.S. policy is actually to have a sustainable long-term response, sustainable, domestically sustainable, then I think it's the right policy, which is um, it's going to be long-term. It's going to cost a lot of money, get a lot of other countries to pay a lot for it. 
establish complicity from other countries. Not cooperation, complicity. Cooperation is easy. Cooperation, when things are going well, get other countries to say support you, great. Complicity is what happens when things aren't going well and those countries aren't allowed to run off, right? And having a couple of Saudis flying missions along with the United States is complicit. It means that when civilians are killed, the Saudis can't criticize the U.S. because they're part of the mission. And the Emiratis are part of the mission. And the Brits, and the French, and the Aussies, and the Canadians. I think the fact that Obama had no strategy to begin with got a lot of criticism in the U.S. If you want to put a team together, it behooves you not to have a strategy until you've actually talked to members of your team and say, what do you guys think we should do, right? That, that, that is a reduction of American exceptionalism and arrogance, which is important in this environment. And I think there is some learning that's actually taken place as a consequence on ISIS. Uh, you talk to foreign ministers that are part of the coalition now, and they will reluctantly admit and agree that that has actually happened. Turkey, the exception, of course, but the Turks are in an impossible situation. We can talk about this if you like. Um, I mean, it's very clear the Turks very frustrated the U.S. was not willing to oppose Assad uh, in a more aggressive way over the last few years. I've gotten lots of questions from people all over the world about ISIS in the last couple weeks. No one asked me anymore about the war in Syria, though it's been by far the largest humanitarian catastrophe uh, we've faced. Other big issue um, on ISIS does make likelihood of Iranian nuclear deal much lower, right? Um, it's harder to talk about Iranian nuclear issue in isolation from what's happening on the ground in Iraq and Syria. Uh, Shia increasingly fighting against ISIS on the ground. Americans, Europeans with Sunni uh, uh, doing the bombing uh, from the air. Uh, that just isn't going to work well. We're running out of time. There's probably not an extension. The reformists in, Iranian, uh, in, in Iran are looking very weak on this. I think deal doesn't happen. And that probably means these relatively low oil prices do not persist um, into early 2015. Uh, briefly on China, Hong Kong, uh, I doubt we're going to be talking about that in 2015. Uh, the, uh, the Chinese uh, opposition uh, in Hong Kong said, what was it, a week and a half ago, uh, that if uh, you do not resign, uh, C.Y. Lung, the, the chief executive in, in Hong Kong, that they were going to occupy uh, government buildings. And the response from the Hong Kong government was, how about nothing? Would, would nothing work for you? Um, and uh, it turns out that nothing probably is going to work uh, perfectly fine because uh, it's, a, it's a very nonviolent movement. It's relatively leaderless. Uh, and there's not any international support, and there's not a lot of support in Hong Kong, and mainland China uh, has no interest whatsoever in supporting these guys. So ultimately, they can wait them out, and the numbers will diminish, um, or they can just bring in pro-Chinese demonstrators, and then the police will come in and say that they are restoring order, cracking down on everyone, so much for Occupy Hong Kong. Um, I, I, I've got, there are plenty of questions about where Hong Kong is going long term, where China is going long term, that are very interesting to talk about. But if you ask me, do I believe this is one of the big geopolitical challenges, I say no. Final point, so I can leave you on something particularly optimistic, is that we've spent so much time talking about major geopolitical challenges in Asia, and there's no question the rise of China is something that everyone in Japan rightly understands to be a problem for them long term, right? But if you ask me right now, for the foreseeable future, I actually feel pretty good about geopolitics in Asia. And I feel pretty good about it because we have three leaders in India, in Japan, and in China, all of whom are charismatic, all of whom are still prioritizing economic transformation at home, all of whom are having some success, um, and all of whom are doing it, but not responding to crisis, right? They're not being forced to. It's not like the Americans after Lehman Brothers collapse, and then we show we can govern for a few months, right? Because we have to fix the financial crisis. It's not like the Europeans following the Eurozone collapse when they show that they can govern very briefly because otherwise, you know, sort of it's, it's the end of the Eurozone. This is the, these are three countries that are doing it on their terms, uh, their time frame, their priorities. And while I, I, I do not pretend to say that that makes me optimistic long term that these three leaders are going to be, go down in history as you know, sort of the, the, the most extraordinary leaders in their country, uh, I do believe that it means that in the near term, they all would like more stability in their backyard.
And absolutely, we see that in Japan, China. We see it with the delegations going back and forth, the business environment. We see it with high levels of Chinese tourists coming to the U.S. We see it with the cultural exchange, the ballet, uh, Shanghai, this sort of thing. Um, we see it with the envoys being exchanged. We see it with uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, speech at the United Nations uh, a week and a half ago. Uh, again, does not, none of this makes me say Japan, China is going to be fine ad infinitum. Because if Chinese reform domestically doesn't work or gets pushed back and they start going a nationalist route, life can get very ugly indeed. There's massive uncertainty. But for the near term, Japan's actually in a better position than it has been historically. Modi's election helps. That's a real relationship that's improving dramatically, and the Chinese aren't sure how to handle that yet, which means they don't want to rock the boat too much. The United States is paying a little bit more attention to Japan these days than it was six months ago. Okay, not a lot, but a little. Uh, sending Hegel over to take the lead, to be point on Asia as opposed to Biden. Probably useful in that regard, right? So there's a lot, and, and, and I'm reasonably optimistic about TPP in 2015, believe it or not something that I think we'll actually go through. Um, I know, I know, it's, we've been saying that for years, but, but this time um, it could happen. Uh, so, I mean, on balance, I think that, you know, in our backyard here, uh, there are some things that we should be more, more positive about. But as we look forward to the geopolitical environment, uh, generally, uh, it's a lot harder. Um, we, I said 15, 20 minutes. That's, that's about what I've done. Yep. So let's, I mean, uh, we've got a whole hour, which me, and this is, uh, this is not a shy group uh, from th those that I know. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to engaging uh, directly with all of you. Can I sit down for the rest of it? Is Absolutely. that okay? Okay, yep. good. That's what I'll do. Okay, so um, anyone with any questions, state your name and affiliation and Ask Ian what you like. Any, uh, any questions, please? Yes, sir. Hey, my name is Stefano Carre for the Italian Economic Daily newspaper. Uh, in two days in Milan, Italy, all the leaders of uh, Europe and Asia will meet for the ASEM summit, probably with the exception of Modi of India that is not coming. So what do you think of this kind of summit? Uh, I mean, do you pay attention to this uh, kind of summit like Europe Asia? Or, uh, or maybe the only interesting thing is that Putin will uh, come, and so it will be the first occasion for him to meet uh, all the leaders after the Crimea crisis. Well, I mean, first of all, any meeting that Putin attends is, uh, is worth talking about these days, right? Because the beautiful thing about Putin is he's not scripted. He doesn't care. He'll just say what he likes. His press conferences are by far the most interesting press conferences of any sitting head of state, right? Certainly of a major country, right? Um, I, look, I, as, as the person who coined the term G0, I tend to be somewhat more skeptical about the utility of large-scale symmetry than many of my confederates. But I, I will say that... Um, the United Nations General Assembly meeting. Thank God it happened when it did, because there was a critical summit on Ebola, and the vast majority of heads of state and foreign ministers that attended had no idea how serious it was and how bad the leadership lacuna was until they were in that meeting. And so when, when you have global challenges that are large, and that are surprising, it is really useful to have a format where everyone can see that, wow, that person's surprised, that person's, we've got a problem here, we have to, resources were devoted to West Africa far faster because of that UN summit. And I think in an environment where geo, geopolitical conflicts are growing um, and coming up more quickly, the utility of large-scale symmetry simply to exchange information and, and understand where the world is becomes more important. Now, that's very different from saying these are meetings where decisions get taken and get implemented. That is, we're, we're very far from that. And we're very far from that on everything, um, on climate, on trade, on, you know, on, on, on peace, security, dealing with refugees, cyber, you name it. So if you ask me, would I expect headlines to come out of that summit 
which would be meaningful in terms of international governance? The answer is absolutely no. Do I think that these are important meetings that deserve attendance because we need to have our leaders spending more time with each other in that kind of an environment? The answer is absolutely yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bremer, uh, I'm Rudolf Tenhout. I'm a, I cover uh, Asian energy markets for European energy media. Um, so the Chinese and Japanese will uh, play it cool. What about the South China Sea? I mean, China doesn't have a counterweight really there in that region. How do you, what, uh, yeah, how do you see things evolve uh, there? Uh, that's the right question to ask from a security perspective because, uh, I mean, I think particularly on South China and particularly Vietnam, the Chinese see uh, an environment where this isn't as critical to American security. There's not an obvious counterweight. Uh, why not press a little bit and see um, if they can change the status quo? I think the operative term there, there was a little bit. Uh, again, I, I, don't, I don't see China wanting to stir up massive geopolitical tensions anywhere just now. I think they do feel like they overextended themselves on that front, um, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, certainly at the beginning of the Obama administration, uh, they ended up with a backlash that led a lot of countries in the region to want to support and embrace the U.S. more than they otherwise would like. The Chinese are aware of the fact that Hillary Clinton might well be the next president. They're one of the few countries in the world that desperately don't want to see her. Uh, they, they, they don't like her, right? I mean, they view her as a kind of an architect of anti-China containment with some legitimate reason. Um, and, uh, and so I think that they're going to be, yes, they're going to press um, and, uh, because they see little military downside for them, little security risk um, around, you know, sort of running a whole bunch of tour groups uh, through contested territories uh, with Vietnam. Uh, or, or oil rigs or what have you, or thousands of fishing boats that are effectively an extension uh, of, the people's, uh, of the people's navy. Um, but, but I don't see that as creating the kind of geopolitical tension that's going to make global headlines. In fact, it's precisely because that's true that the Chinese are going to continue to press. So yeah, I mean, look, China's military is growing. And, uh, and they're going to get more and more capable and they're going to extend and expand uh, the area that they continue, consider to be uh, critical to Chinese interests. And we saw that with the white paper on Hong Kong, and we've seen that with integration in Taiwan. And over time, they're going to capture more countries. I mean, long term, what the Japanese have to worry about right now, if you ask me, where, where does China really determine policy in Asia? Who do they own? Laos, Cambodia, sort of North Korea, like they want it. Um, but, but not the larger economies. Well, I mean, is that going to be true in five or ten years' time? Uh, if you're Australia, you know, right now you've got a very strong security uh, arrangements with the United States on just about everything, and you have very strong economic vulnerability and connections with China. Uh, how is that going to look in five, ten years? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be much harder to balance. Uh, it's gonna, uh, Thailand, much harder to balance. Singapore, harder to balance. No question. And I think if you're Vietnam with, with, an, with a government that is massively mistrustful of, sometimes even hateful of China, but an economy that's overwhelmingly going to be determined by what's happening and your level of integration there, South Korea is one that you could easily see flipping, given where the younger generation of South Koreans happen to be. And in that regard, I think it's critically important that Abe works to improve that relationship as much as humanly possible. And I think they've taken good steps in that, in that regard. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Anna Fifield from the Washington Post. So, as we know, Kim Jong-un has mysteriously reappeared today, just as quickly as he disappeared. So, you tweeted earlier today that it's hard to be relieved by this. So, can you just share your thoughts on uh, what's going on in North Korea, and in particular, if we learned anything from his absence? Well, Thanks. I, uh, uh, critically, I haven't spoken with Dennis Rodman yet, <laughs> so I have less information than I'd like. Um, I. Um, no, I mean, that's kind of, that, it's a joke, but it's also serious And that Americans, I mean, he's probably the American with the most direct understanding of what the hell is going on, um, and he hasn't been there since he's disappeared. I know, it's a little disturbing, but, um, and he was such a great basketball player, that's what's so frustrating about it. Um, but 
look, I, I was not, I don't know if any, any of you saw, I was on, I did an interview with Charlie Rose uh, a couple days ago, and we talked about North Korea quite a bit, actually. Uh, and, and uh, you know, he, he uh, I told him I was not particularly unnerved that Kim Jong-un was gone. And the reason for that was because right after that um, he was missing, uh, you had a, a surprisingly large delegation and senior delegation of military leaders go over to South Korea for the closing ceremony of the Asia Pacific Games, I guess it was, and then also talk about, hey, let's, let's meet going forward and, uh, and build on, uh, on, on, some, uh, on, on some diplomatic softening, some openness. Two things there. Number one, if there had been a crisis internally in North Korea, I don't believe they would have engaged in that kind of new policy making. But secondly, and much more obvious, they wouldn't have left the country, right? I mean, a totalitarian state, if things are, are truly unstable, you don't leave. That's how you end up not coming back. I mean, you know, right? I mean, th this has happened. We've seen that game before. Um, Pakistan, Thailand, you name it, right? Um, so I wasn't particularly concerned. My presumption was one of two things. Either Kim Jong-un was still in charge or Kim Jong-un has not actually been in charge for some time, but that has been a pretty incremental process and the military is fine. Um, I'm not sure which of those two is true. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I mean, my thought process is probably more important than this than what my conclusions are because none of us have really good ways to make conclusions. Um, my thought process is, on the one hand, you kind of would like to believe um, that Kim Jong-un um, is, uh, is not as in charge because the military has been seen um, to be pretty stable and engaged all the, way tr all the way through. On the other hand, you kind of think that he is in charge because the Chinese government, which knows these matters better than almost anyone, has been very dissatisfied with his rule and won't engage with him. Where if, it, if the military were, if the Chinese government felt the military that they're engaged with was still in, in, a, in a pretty stable place, you'd like to think that they'd be showing more face, right? Um, having said that, Xi Jinping, and maybe he just doesn't want to deal with the North Koreans. Uh, it could be a policy difference. I mean, that, my thought process is, is hard on this. Um, I'm not relieved by Kim Jong-un coming back simply because I didn't think it was that big of a deal when he was gone. This is a country that ultimately is not likely to be stable for very long. It is hard for them to maintain this level of control of information uh, for people that are suffering immensely and most of them aren't aware of the fact that they are. That, in this world, that's hard to do. And clearly that's a massive risk for South Korea at some point in the next decade but damned if I know when it is. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, I, I'm not someone who believes that uh, the challenge with North Korea is that they're suddenly going to engage in military adventurism against the South. I think the problem is that they implode. And, and I, th I also think that those things can happen very, very quickly. So. Okay, Dom. Dan Slater, Delphi Network. Um, you mentioned that there's been very little uh, reflection of the geopolitical turmoil that you've described uh, onto the financial markets. My question is, is this because the financial markets are now dysfunctional and are actually not reflecting risk due to a number of central bank activities, quantitative easings, and the fact that um, what used to be the, the country risk being established as the risk-free risk is now essentially irrelevant? That's a good question. Um, uh do you, I guess one of the things would be, do you really believe that that's true of all the central banks? It's clearly true in the United States. It's a little true in Britain. It's not really true in Europe, in continental Europe. Um, I, I mean, I was at the IMF last week. I, I, I did the opening session with uh, the German, the Italian foreign minister, finance ministers and Larry Summers and David Lipton. And we, I mean, uh, Larry and I came away incredibly I wouldn't say despondent because that's not that's not my personality, um, but absolutely really negative about what's happening in Europe. And so, I mean, I guess I would say that they're, they're given given the IMF outlook, which has been downgraded, the, the new mediocre that Christine Lagarde talked about. You would think that 
Draganomics does not strike me as robust response that really makes this all go away. Um, but Yellen's a very different story. And, and, uh, and everything you hear from the Americans, and the U.S. is the biggest economy out there still by far, is that the U.S. is going to respond not just to the U.S. recovery, but also to the lack of growth in the Eurozone. And that, that definitely moves in the direction of your question. Um, but look, I'm a political scientist. So to the extent that I have an analytic bias, it's not left or right. It's that politics matters more, right? And, and in that regard, I would say it does strike me as true that most of the geopolitics out there, while they are significant concerns near term to people that are investing in those markets, I mean, you know, bauxite prices should move um, if Ebola starts, you know, sort of swinging over um, to Ghana. Uh, I mean, cocoa has already taken a move, uh, and it will probably continue. Rubber, I mean, those, so there are market hits, but they're small, because these are small countries. Russia, uh, definitely the Russian markets have, well, they're way down, and we've seen massive capital flight, and that is absolutely an accurate reflection of geopolitical risk. But I don't believe that the United States economy is actually, what I would say is there's much more uncertainty geopolitically in the world over the next few years than there has been over the past few. If I were investor, that would make me less interested in growth and more interested in resilience and anti-fragility. And that should mean a stronger dollar. That should mean U.S. real estate does better. That should mean more capital flows generally into the American market. So I, I, I don't actually think that this is purely an economic deal. I see that these geopolitical crises do two things. They, they actually create more support for the U.S. as the cleanest dirty shirt, as I said before, but they also facilitate expanded G0. And, and, and that will be true until so, crisis, uh, there is a crisis or series of crises that are sufficiently large that it requires a greater response, or the geopolitical environment evolves enough that you could start to see a country or group of countries providing a new architecture for leadership. We are far from either of those two outcomes at this point. Okay, the gentleman over there, and then you, sir. Jochen Legewi, CNC. The Japanese government is preparing for a potential first deal of submarine technology and submarine exports to Australia. Any comments on this? Sure. Uh, I expect that the Japanese will doing, do, be doing a lot more of that with a lot of countries. I'd be stunned if we don't see closer Japan-India defense cooperation on, uh, on more advanced technologies going forward. The Indian government uh, is one of the largest, I believe it's the largest purchaser of arms uh, imports anywhere in the world. It's overwhelmingly been from Russia. It's very corrupt. It's, it's also very poor quality. And I think Modi, that's something Modi would really like to change. I see Japan as a huge beneficiary as long as the regulatory environment is, uh, is sufficiently, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 sufficiently allows that. Um, uh, you know, the fact that Japan, that Abe wants uh, to make moves to uh, allow his country to become a more normalized uh, diplomatic uh, and security power uh, over time, I think is constructive. I don't believe that some of the more nationalist rhetoric that we've seen from the cabinet is constructive. I don't believe you know trips to Yasukuni are constructive, or, or d discussions about about history or comfort women are, are constructive. Um, but I think there's been there's been not a huge amount of that of in recent days, um, and uh, and I think that it is it's seriously it actually is it's important for Japan. Uh, especially in an environment where the United States commitments long term are a little bit less certain for Japan um, to, uh, to be more assertive uh, about um, its own ability um, to, uh, to think about uh, national security and defense, not just by itself, but also in partnership with a constellation of like-minded nations. Okay, uh, this gentleman here. Nishimura with the Hokkaido Shimbun News. And there is an argument that the uh, authoritarian democracy, like we've seen in the Russia or China, is taking over the liberal democracy in the United States or European countries. And because uh, those countries, those uh, authoritarian 
democracy is less uh, affected by the volatility of the market economy in the world. And on the other hand, those countries facing in, facing the, some kind of a, a trouble inside, like we've seen in Hong Kong. So how do you, how do you think the democracy the, as a governance uh, affects and the future of the uh, uh, world economy? Uh, well, I mean, so that's a great question. Uh, it, it is, uh, first of all, if that were true, that uh, authoritarian states were much more resilient, uh, then the dollar would clearly be weaker. So the markets don't agree with that. If you're Chinese and worth over a million dollars, you desperately want your money out of the country. It's not because you're not a patriot. It's not because you don't believe China's going to grow. It's because you, you worry about the uncertainty, and rightly so. Um, same thing's true with Russians, of course. I, I think what's happening is, I mean, we had this moment, you know, everyone, whenever someone asks a question like this, of course, we all immediately think about uh, uh, Frank Fukuyama and the end of history. And there was this, you know, sort of wonderful U.S. exceptionalist moment when we decided that our political model was just like the be-all, end-all, and that was it, and everyone's going to become like us. It turns out that that was somewhat premature. Um, I do believe that there is now a real challenge to central governments and the legitimacy of central governments all over the world. And it's the Arab Spring, and it's Occupy Hong Kong, but it was Occupy Wall Street, and it's Piketty, and it's all this stuff, right? Now, I would argue that there are different responses to that in different countries, and that's really what's going to answer your question. I think there are three different types of responses. The first response is the one you see in consolidated democracies. Let's look at the United States. We now have a Congress in the United States that nobody thinks is any good. They have 6% approval ratings in the U.S., which is historic low for Gallup polls, for example. It has passed less legislation than any Congress in the recorded history of congressional legislation um, at this point in, the, in Congress. And yet what's happening in the US is decentralization. So nothing gets done in Washington, lots of stuff gets done at the state level. Immigration law, energy law, trade policy, same-sex marriage, uh, drug use and legalization, so much is happening at the local level in the U.S., and it's driving a lot of productivity and growth, and it's driving a set of, of governance standards that actually makes the U.S. more reflective of a divergent population, and that, that's clearly stabilizing and resilient. And this is happening in Canada, and it's happening in the U.K. after the Scottish referendum. I think it will happen in Spain, given what's happening with Catalonia. Of course they should be getting more rights of what to do with their money. They're a wealthy place that has horrible infrastructure because all of it ends up going to Madrid. That's going to change. So that's what's happening in consolidated democracies. The problem is that in consolidated authoritarian states with resources, the exact opposite thing is happening. Is that they, they have central governance that are being challenged, and the response whether it's being challenged from Hong Kong or whether it's being challenged internationally if you're Russia and your neighbors and losing support, the response is centralization of more power. Putin takes more power. Xi Jinping takes more power. The Gulf states. Egypt is probably more consolidated today than it was not was under Mubarak, never mind after the Arab Spring. So that's a very different kind of response. Now, as a political scientist, I will tell you that that does not bring these two types of countries closer together. It brings them farther apart. I said there were three types of responses. There are. The third type of response are countries that do not have the level of resource to the governments that either the first two categories did. And if you are in that third category, your response is to entrench with a smaller group of loyalists, tribal loyalists, sectarian loyalists, you know, party loyalists, what have you. And what that means is you no, no longer govern your whole country effectively. Think about Nigeria. They've lost the north, a decent part of it, right, to Boko Haram. I'm not sure they're going to get it back. Look at what's happened in Syria, or Iraq, or Mali, or Libya, or Yemen, or Afghanistan, or Pakistan. You're increasingly going to see a bunch of these countries where central governance isn't working, and so they'll end up being a place where only part of the government will work, over part of the country, and the rest of it will be functionally failed. Um, and 
and, and that's that's not fun either, right? So that's that's the, the question you ask. I think has a does not have a neat answer. It's actually very complicated. Okay, gentlemen in the uh, white shirts, and then the gents in the blue shirts. Thomas Sullivan, uh, Matthew Sian. I wanted to just go back to this gentleman's question about the economy again, um, and, and to ask your perspective on, you know, Abenomics and Kurodonomics, as if that's what you'd call it. I think John Maudlin, for instance, this morning has said Japan has chosen the most aggressive mon monetary policy in the history of the world, and we have a Bank of Japan here that has, you know, significantly built up its its balance sheet. Do you think this is sustainable? Are we going back to a 250? yen to the dollar exchange rate. Um, so I was just w wanted to know if you could most share. Uh, yeah, most aggressive in the history of the world sounds exaggerated. Um, again, I'm not an economist and I'm not a central bank watcher, but I will tell you that um, I do believe that Abenomics was necessary, um, a particular and, and in some ways it was a response to Japan being number three and China now being number two and China going to be number one. Uh, Japan does need to be more robust, um, and you have to find a way to unlock more value um, that exists in spades within Japanese society. I mean, the things that I'm most excited about, about Abenomics personally, have less to do with Kuroda and the central bank, have more to do with bringing women into the workforce. I mean, you know, when you've got 50% of your society that is incredibly educated and fundamentally underemployed, um, that's ludicrous, right? And, and Japan has to do something about that. It was uh, paving the way for TPP. Uh, I think it's very important for Japan to be integrated more tightly with a bunch of like-minded economies in the world that together will be 40% of the world's GDP. Not because Japan can't do China, but because Japan-China relations are so uncertain over the long term. Japan needs a hedge. I think that you know Abe's willingness to do those sorts of things, um, it, it, which, which no leaders before him were engaging with. I mean, taking, it, it requires a level of political courage. It's not popular among the men that run Japan to, to actually say, you know what, um, uh, we've got to do something about this and we've got to take it seriously. It's not popular. TPP was not popular, right? I mean, it was known in Japan. There was, there was a lot of opposition to it. So I, I think that uh, some bold leadership in Japan matters. And I also think the intangibles, I mean, you know, I, I've gotten to know Abe, uh, you know, reasonably well over the years. Um, and I think the fact that he is charismatic on the world stage, speaks more openly, you know, puts his hand on your shoulder. He's almost Clintonian uh, in a Japanese perspective, right? I think that really works in the way that it works for Xi Jinping in China. I mean, you know, he came after Xi Jinping, came after this incredibly bloodless uh, Chinese leadership that everyone made fun of and no one was proud of. In a world that doesn't have global leadership, it's really important for you know, sort of these, these countries to feel like they have someone that they can actually follow. And the U.S. doesn't have that. I mean, there was a moment after, the last inaugur after Obama's inauguration when the entire country came through. He was extraordinary on the stump. He was you know, sort of very, very um, uh, emotional um, in, his, in, in his capturing uh, a moment that America was ready for, I think, in the depths of the financial crisis. And yet what we've ended up with is Obama's kind of a thinker that doesn't lead. And he's followed by, he, he, and he follows Bush, who was a leader that didn't think. And I think that you really, you really need both um, in this society. And I think what you have right now in India, Japan, and China, and to a degree in Germany, and to a degree in Mexico, and maybe in Indonesia, is you have a series of leaders who aren't global leaders at all. They, none of them have any aspirations to be global leaders, but they all are leaders that think. And they may not be successful, and not all their policies are we going to agree with, but it, it, it's, it's in, that's, that's a hole that is being felt more in the world today, and countries that have that will benefit more. 
Uh, thank you, Michael Brook. I'm an associate member. Notwithstanding your optimism about the inter. Uh, national relations between Japan and China particularly. Um, recent media reports have written uh, that the, a majority of, of, of people in, I think, at least China, believe there will be some form of warfare between Japan and China in the, relatively, in, in the future. Um, were there to be a surprise, for example, a surprise attack by the Chinese on the Senkaku Islands, what could and what would and what could the Obama administration uh, do uh, to react to such an event? Well, so I did, I did it, it bemused me that that statistic came out, I think, on the same day that um, we saw the highest, a record level of Chinese tourists actually coming to Japan uh, for one month. It was the highest ever. And it may be because they want to see it before the war. Uh, uh, it may be they want to check it out before they take you over. I mean, that's also possible. I mean, I, either explanation works. Um, look, I mean, it's very clear that I'm being funny, but the, Chi the Chinese, it's very clear that the Chinese and the Japanese uh, have no mutual trust for each other whatsoever. You've all seen the polls that have come for, you know, sort of the general levels of warm feeling between the two countries. It's, it tends to be in the single digits. Um, South Korea, Japan is better, but not by a lot. Um, and I, I, I wasn't surprised to see that the Chinese uh, believe that there, there would be a war long term between the two countries. I mean, I think the propaganda is still high and the education that uh, you know, Japanese and Chinese are getting about their two countries and their histories mm. have virtually no overlap. I mean, it's kind of like Israel-Palestine, right? I mean, uh, but with a lot more at stake uh, in the region and globally. I think your question is the right question to ask, which is, uh, so if, if we did have a, a, a fight, and irrespective of how it happened, I mean, the Chinese attacked Senkaku surprise attack, or let's just say there was a mistake, and they got too close, and a, an airplane was downed, or a ship got downed, and then, you, you know, you end up with a, you know, mutual escalation, and the Chinese make all sorts of threats, and the real question is, okay, America is your ally in Japan. Does America stand by you? Well, let me give you an example. Uh, I, uh, right during the NATO summit, Obama um, made very clear that while the U.S. was not going to support Ukraine militarily, let's make no question that the Baltic states and Poland are NATO allies and you touch them at your peril. And uh, Obama went to Estonia and actually said the U.S. stands by Estonia. And uh, a day later, uh, the uh, Russian government sends smoke grenades across the Estonian border, radio jamming, and then they actually abducted an Estonian intelligence officer and brought him back to Russia. Which is, you gotta applaud that, right? I mean, on, uh, in terms of the Russians, you gotta, I mean, I mean if, you, if you wanna call a bluff, that is the way to do it. Because the Russians are agitated. They're like, you know, I know this is meaningless, so stop. Just stop doing it. And, um, and this is the problem, is that I do believe that America means it when they say they're standing up to allies, but what exactly do we mean by that? Because clearly we don't mean we're going to stand up no matter what in any circumstance. And, and, I mean, if there were a Russian invasion of Estonia with tanks coming across the border, I absolutely believe, yes, there'd be a discussion. I don't think it'd be automatic, even though it's, you know, meant to be automatic. There would be a discussion because this is, the ramifications are serious. And I think you'd want there to be a discussion, by the way. Um, these aren't robots. Um, but I think the Americans would absolutely be on the ground, as would NATO. As would NATO. I believe that. And, I bl and there have been conversations already among NATO with sending special forces if the Russians were going to start agitating demonstrations that became violent with Russian communities in Estonia and Latvia, for example, which might happen. So they are planning for that. So, uh, you know, this all leads to your question. So what would happen um, if there were a flare-up between China and Japan? My answer is the same. There'd be a conversation. It would be a serious conversation. There'd be a strong desire to support Japan, but it depends on what exactly happened. I, I know, and I'm saying that, you know, it, how did that happen? What was the buildup? Were the Japanese truly blameless? You know, are the Americans going to try to get to calm it down? You, you can't, you can't, I mean, if you simply say, 
It was Pearl Harbor in the Senkakus. Okay, then it's most likely in that case that the Americans will respond immediately and vigorously. But I, that is, that's, of all of the plausible scenarios, that strikes me as really tail end, right? So I just want to, I want to structure the question in a way that I think is most useful for us to think about where NATO actually is. Because this is complicated stuff. Yeah. Okay, yes, sir. Makoto Honjo Associate. Um, how do you sort of view the um, China-Russia relationship um, going forward? Because uh, there seems to be a lot of um, interaction amongst the two countries with the um, BRICS Bank and so on, uh, as well as the uh, cooperation and the uh, gas and so on and so on. Um, but you know, historically, China has been very wary about China, uh, about Russia, and uh, how would you sort of see the uh, their relationship sort of unfolding in the near term and hopefully the long term? Well, um, I think this is a relationship that has actually changed a lot in the last year. Uh, historically, the Russians. Um, we're much more wary of getting close to the Chinese. Chinese are bigger. Um, they push hard on commercial terms. There's a lot of anti-Chinese racism in Russian circles. There are demographic concerns in Siberia. The list goes on. Border issues historically, you name it. But um, I think the U.S.-Russia relationship at this point is inexorably broken. Uh, I don't think it's fixable. I mean, maybe in 10 or 20 years, but I mean, as long as Putin is there, uh, I, I don't think you can get it back. I think Putin's made a decision that the Americans are coming after him, they're coming after uh, his friends, his colleagues, and he has to respond. And th this, is, this has been building up for years. Uh, the, the Americans, he believes the Americans want to facilitate Russian decline. It's NATO enlargement, it's energy diversification, it's missile defense, it's Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and so I, I believe that uh, Putin has uh, swallowed hard and decided that he really is going to orient much more strategically towards China. And you're going to see that with a lot of joint engagements. You'll see it with tighter integration and expansion of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. You'll see it with more integration on financial issues, including the BRICS Bank. They talked about a joint ratings agency. You'll see closer coordination on internet issues between the Chinese and the Russians and their positions globally. Um, you, you see it in uh, the, China, the Russians offering China equity stakes in the largest uh, energy field in East Siberia, Vancor. Uh, the ga Gazprom deal is not actually that. I mean, I know it's a big deal, $400 billion, but they were negotiating that anyway. That was just the Russians capitulating to better Chinese terms. That's not as big of a deal as all of this other stuff. And also, you know, Putin and Xi Jinping, when they meet, they do actually talk about their mutual concern for, for Western values, uh, undermining them, that they, they focus on political stability. I, I think there's something to this, uh, and, and it's going to be, become a very important relationship to watch, uh, potentially to counterbalance. There is some utility in China being closer to Russia, though, which is that the Chinese are much more oriented towards the status quo because they're not in decline. The world is moving to them, um, which means that the Chinese don't really want the Russians to engage in a cyber war against American financial institutions. And to the extent that China ended up with influence there, they would probably try to restrain the worst excesses of Putin. And we might see that if the Iranian deal falls apart, they, the Chinese might try to rein the Russians in somewhat in terms of sanctions breaking behavior, for example. So I, I, I think it, 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 there is a little bit of a counterbalance here, but generally speaking, this is something that most advanced industrial democracies do not want to see. Okay, if I may, just uh, ask a quick question. Um, you mentioned earlier <clears throat> that the, um, the TPP may happen next year. I was just wondering, of course, with the two main players in this, Japan and the United States, which side is going to give concessions? Where and how might this manifest, given all the blocks and non-starts we've had so far? Well, I think that so far um, the, the Americans have not been as interested in sort of really sitting down and negotiating hard because nothing was going to get done pre-midterm uh, elections. I think the question will be right after that, mm -hmm. do we see renewed seriousness? Is this something Obama really wants to do? I think the answer is yes. They put mm -hmm. a lot of work into it. 
He has someone that's very close and trusted to him, Mike Froman, uh, actually leading the process. He's quite capable as a trade negotiator. Um, and, uh, and, and I also think that it's one piece of policy that Obama really will push Congress on in 2015. Now, uh, we don't yet know what Congress is going to look like. It's going to be close mm -hmm. as to whether the Republicans take over or the Democrats hold on to the Senate. Um, on balance, I think it's slightly more likely the Dems hold on but lose seats. Mm -hmm. That is not a popular view. Um, that's just on the basis of our vote counting um, in, in the key districts. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's been hard for Obama to get things through um, a, um, a mixed Congress. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're suddenly going to become easy. Um, and he's got to get trade promotion authority through to make this work. So it's going to be a challenge, but I think that if you, if you look at all the things on Obama's agenda in 2015, mm -hmm. I would put this near the top of what he really wants to accomplish. Mm. Yeah. And you would say most of the issues lie on the American side here rather than the Japanese side? I think there's always give and take when you mm -hmm. have negotiations. I think that you know there's a lot of pressure from all of the Southeast Asian governments that Japan has to do a lot of lifting for them because they're going to get steamrolled by the Americans one on one. So Japan has a lot riding on it. I don't think that, I, I think there will be give and take in that negotiation. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe time for one more question. Yes, sir. I'm very impressed. My name is Khalil Hassan. I'm Ambassador of Bahrain here. My question is, how you see Middle East in 50 years' time? You say 50? <laughs> Did you really say 50? <laughs> um, look, I... I um, uh, in 50 years' time, uh, I don't believe that uh, hydrocarbons out of the earth is, it will be the primary uh, energy source that we use. So um, the question will be, um, are we able to diversify in a meaningful way um, all, of the, uh, all of the major economies in the Middle East? Um, and are we able to get um, much more interest and willingness in promoting the levels of education internally that have so led to development in so many other parts of the world, but the Middle East has lagged very badly behind. I think if those two things can happen, then the Middle East will go through the same globalization processes that every other part of the world is. I don't believe that Islam prevents the creation of civilization. I think radical Islam prevents the creation of civilization. And I think radical sectarianism prevents the creation of civilization. Um, th there's no question, look, uh, the, the Middle East countries have suffered more than almost anyone else in the world from the oil curse. Lots of easy money that you can grab for, for, for free, effectively. I mean, not only do you have the oil, but it's right under the sand. It's easy. It's trivial to take out. It's massive wealth. And so you don't need to reform. And so you have societies in many of these countries that are incredibly conservative uh, that have not really developed. And you know, I talk about the role of women in Japan, but I mean, the role of women in Saudi Arabia is a very different story. And yet you absolutely have to move on those sorts of things um, in order to, uh, to make the governments work long term. I do believe that King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia is, um, in the context of his country, a, a pretty uh, law far-sighted leader someone who actually does want to make a difference, but he's also fighting against a very conservative society, not just the royal family, but a conservative society. And it's hard to do. Uh, I mean, you'd think letting women drive would be trivial, right, in today's age. Actually, you go talk to Saudis, it's not trivial. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I think that uh, that's going to be a challenge. Those sorts of things are going to be big challenges these countries have to work with. Um, I also believe that in the nearer term future, China is going to be the dominant player in the Middle East overwhelmingly. Uh, they're going to need all the energy resources, and the Americans aren't. And countries like Saudi Arabia are going to have to figure out how they want to work with China. It's going to be very, very different than the relations they've had with the U.S. historically. Um, and uh, I think that's going to be a very interesting shift. Uh, state capitalism, uh, commercially driven but not as geopolitical and a great unwillingness of the Chinese to get involved deeply in the kind of security issues that the Americans have historically cared an awful lot about. Look at China on South Sudan right now. At least China in Iraq, uh, 
The Chinese aren't doing it, but they, they approximately believe the United States will. In South Sudan, the Chinese have all the exposure. No one else is paying attention. And the Chinese have done almost nothing. A couple weeks ago, they, they finally said they were going to send 700 uh, peacekeepers uh, to help the UN force. It's a drop. It, it is a shift. That's a big deal for China. It just ain't a big deal for South Sudan. And, and I, um, I, I, I think that anyone that looks at the Middle East and thinks about China's relationship there has got to say, wow, it's going to take a long time before we have any um, support internationally that reflects what we had historically. Now, let's face it, American support in the Middle East was a mixed blessing and uh, didn't always win favors from people on the ground in the region from every stripe. Uh, but China's going to have different problems. Uh, so uh, I mean, it wouldn't, it's not necessarily going to be better. 50, 50 years is a hell of a long time to talk about anything, you know? So, okay, um, I hope we're still here, <laughs> right? You have time for one quick last uh, question? Yep, yep. yep. Uh, Aaron? Aaron Sheldrick Reuters. You're talking about hydrocarbons. Um, you mentioned you think if, the, if and when, as you think, the Iranian deal collapses, oil prices will rise. Um, but Ar Iranian exports have fallen by half. They're down below <clears throat> a million barrels in the most recent numbers, at least for the four main buyers. Can you talk a bit more about that? Why, why is Iranian oil relevant anymore it's, from it's, a market fundamental? It's less relevant than it used to be. I guess uh, we, we would believe that uh, with additional sanctions, it would probably go down by about another half. Um, and that's significant. The Saudis can make it up, but it's still going to be, that's going to be tight in terms of what they have left on the board. The markets won't like that. Uh, I'm also a little bullish on Libya. Uh, I think that uh, the markets are underpricing the level of uh, degradation in Libyan governance and the ability to actually continue piping there. So those are the two places I think that right now the market's a little too sanguine about what's happening. Um, I'm not saying uh, oil prices are going to shoot up to 150. They're not. But I'm just saying that the present low, no <clears throat> geopolitics doesn't matter. I don't think they can survive the Iran deal. Also, keep in mind that, you know, you're still going to have, you're going to have folks like Netanyahu talking about this is unacceptable, we need a bomb. I don't think they will. But just, just you know, that type of commentary does support some general fear premium around uh, energy prices as well. So put those two things together. That's kind of where you go. Yeah. Okay, Ian. Well, thanks very much for coming along, and could you give me a warm round of applause, please? Thank you. And we have the uh, year's uh, membership to the club. So, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah.